Let's take a walk today along the Tiber River with architect Manuel Bravo and talk about ancient Rome. This is one of my favorite things to do where I want people to get a sense of ancient Rome. Come down to the Tiber River. This was the connection to the rest of the Mediterranean. It is so essential. And of course, now we have the big flood walls. And when you build the flood walls, the Pons Cestius here is rebuilt. It's kind of dismantled and rebuilt. On the other side, of course, you got the magnificent Pons Fabricius, 62 BC. So I love this kind of, this, this, this connection to antiquity with the Tiber River. And of course, because of the Tiber Island, historical in itself, you had that easier place to cross the Tiber. So this becomes one of those focal points for exchange of ideas, commerce, trade. You get so much by standing here. Right. So uh, ancient Romans, they, they, all, they had different, so like in the early Republic, they had different civilizations in different uh, areas of the, of the hills, right? Yeah. Uh, so kind of the difficult uh, place to defend, I guess, is the Forum area. And so that's why they all came to trade there, right? Yes. Um, so this was kind of a way to connect uh, everything. Yeah. But then also through the Tiber, they came from all the way from Ostia, right? To, to, uh, to absolutely. The, all the ships from the Mediterranean and all that. Um, but how many uh, actual uh, actual bridges from antiquity do we have that 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 are original. So when we come and take a look at, I mean, there were over a dozen bridges from antiquity. When we go around and look at the ones that we can connect to the past, the real standout is the Pons Fabricius, 62 BC. This is the Pons Acestius, really most of what we see is fourth century AD, but re it dismantled and rebuilt when they built the flood walls in the 19th century. So the really authentic one is the Pons Fabricius, never destroyed, never destroyed by a flood from all of antiquity. And then you have way upstream, heavily rebuilt and reconstructed, you have the Pons Milvius, which is where Constantine fights Maxentius. But that's been rebuilt right. several times over, so not quote unquote authentic. The other one is down the street. The other bridge that really stands out is the broken, it's called the Ponte Rotto, the broken bridge. But that, that we have one arcade still standing is Augustine in date. So if we talk about ancient Roman bridges, in this general vicinity, we have one, two, and three that we can really look at and look at how the Romans built their bridges. Right. I like how, so kind of the more, the most famous one, I, w I would say it's the San Angelo Bridge, right? Oh, of course, yeah, that's, oh, um, absolutely. Ancient. That, that, that one got reconstructed a bit, right? It's not, uh, it's not uh, completely. Uh, sub it's a, substantially, but you're absolutely right. Another ancient bridge that connects right. to the mausoleum of Hadrian Right. That if you think about all the other bridges in between, if you think about all the other bridges breaking apart, falling apart, flooding and so forth, what's left is the bridges crossing the Tiber Island and you got to go all the way to the Pons Elias and that's right. it. So the city became even that much larger, that much harder to navigate through because there's not an easy way to cross except for these two areas. So you're right, Pons Elias is a definitive Roman bridge. Obviously it has a new look to right. it, but the core of that of that bridge really is still ancient second century AD. Okay, and so they built the wall, the flood wall in the 19th century. Yes. Uh, so you know Rome used to have a, a this great relationship with the river Absolutely. because you know you would it would flood, but you would have the river right there. You know. Yeah. All but, the all the buildings came right up to the water's edge. But how how was it? Because um, you get the bridge to that level. Um, and so how, how did this go down? It, it was, it was, was there a sort of a natural uh, incline? Yeah, or... yeah, yeah. If you look at the ancient bridges here is no exception. They're kind of coming up like that. So we don't have some of the, we don't have the subsequent ancient ground level, which by and large was lower than the street level of Lungo Tevere today. So yeah. yes, this bridges would have, they're, they're coming up, it would have felt a little more extreme with the uh, original ground level around the rest of the city. Right. And something that's really interesting to me is the Porto di Ripetta. Yes. Because that used to be this great kind of Baroque opening into the river. You I mean, know? It, it is still there, but it's kind of neglected and forgotten. It doesn't have the same kind of... Uh, but now it's only a flood wall, right? Or correct, it, yeah. Yeah, yeah. It's, I mean, it's just... There was, a, I mean, that's the one of the greatest, I mean, in a certain sense, tragedies of this whole story. Yes, 
we have a new capital of the country. Yes, we now have definitively, let's hope, ended the floodings that would destroy all the beautiful structures or damage those structures in the campus yeah. marshes area. But as a result, you know, I mean, tourists come here and they're like, where's the Tiber? Because you can't even see it. And there's no real continued life here. So, I mean, look, this is underwater typically at some point every year in the winter. So you can't build anything permanently here. So we have definitely lost that connection. The only way to get the connection today is you got to walk down here and feel that 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 kind of connection. But, but by and large, the uh, the width of the Tiber, uh, not divided by the Tiber Island, is about 100 meters. Okay. Yeah, and you can even take a little boat ride in the summer, uh, just outside of the center of Rome, all the way to Ostia Antica, and feel that kind of connection. Right. But otherwise, you you know this is this was that that super highway that brought all those goods, that brought the obelisks, that brought the columns. I mean, without this river connected to the Mediterranean, we'd have nothing. So it was all important to the Romans, brought all the goods to feed the population of a million. Okay. It's essential. I, I think I read somewhere, I think it was the Aburbe Condita or so, I don't know where I read it, but uh, that the first bridge was made to connect the Yaniculum, which is the, the, the hill, to the rest of the city. What was in that area or why did they decide to connect it? So the real the, the history about the, the bridging and the initial bridge first built in wood, according to tradition, the Pons Sublicius, for which, Sublicius, right. yeah, the Pons Sublicius, and they argue, I mean, I, there's lots of scholarship, a lot of ink has been spilled, to, to, really discussing about where it was originally located, which traditionally is further down from where we're standing right now. It's beyond the uh, Tiber Island and so forth. Closer to the Aventine Hill, after the Aventine Hill, so there's a kind of argument going on. But the basic, the, the bottom line was the bridge is there to connect to different people. So the people that were initially in the early Roman times uh, over on that side uh, were even Etruscan. Okay. You know, and the city of A is nine kilometers north of here. So part of it was just connecting people for, for trade. Okay. Before the bridges, it was ferrying people across. And right. the easiest place to ferry people across are these two narrow spots because of the sandbar that it becomes, you know, Tiber Island. So this is the early place where you're crossing and then it's time to build a bridge, but make the bridge of wood so that if somebody comes and attacks you, you can break it apart. Okay. Yeah. So that's that's the story. But I mean, people are coming from, you know, all areas around Rome, into Rome. And one of the main paths from the north, the Via Salaria, so the salt road, it's coming from the north, coming through and continuing to the salt pans uh, where Ostia is going to develop. Okay. So part of it was just, well, I do need to cross the Tiber River from this side to go to the salt pans. Right. So let, let's talk a little bit just about the architecture of the of the bridge itself. Uh, so I've seen that some of them have a little hole in yes, the middle. Yes, like the Pons That's Mericus. for the for the flooding, Absolutely. so it flows more freely, right? right? So in other words, I've got less resistance because I have a big hole in the middle of it. Genius, right? Right. Yeah. And uh, yeah, so it's a kind of a pretty functional thing, and yeah. also it relieves a little bit of the of the weight of yeah. the, of the and bridge. Then, but right. so think about us walking around Rome, and you walk around Rome today near the Pantheon, you see a marker that says, "Here's the flood of 1870." Right. So take that flood, 1870, which wasn't even a bad flood compared to some of the earlier floods in the Renaissance times that are documented, which would be even you know 15 meter, 15 feet higher up. But then yeah. take that reality over here, whether it's much lower. This was entirely submerged. These these bridges were entirely underwater. You know, maybe once every couple of years. So okay. they had to withstand a ton. And it's not just the water. They think about the debris coming through, right? The timbers or the broken so ships. It's kind of like whatever. in Egypt that the Nile sort of flooded every yeah. year, right? Yeah. And that made the, the the land very fertile. Yeah. In this case, it didn't make the land very fertile. <laughs> yeah, I just so wanted to, thing here. I wanted to dedicate that that theater, the theater of Balbus, and now I have to go to the inauguration in a boat. Okay. So the Romans kind of live with the fact that sometimes there's a flood. Yeah, and that's why they didn't have, at, at first, they didn't have a lot of constructions in the Campus Martius, right? Exactly. Which is, which is uh, now like the city center and the place okay. where everybody uh, just goes to see the famous monuments, right? I like mean, the Trevi Fountain and the Piazza yeah. Navona. Imagine the irony of it all that, you know, initially for hundreds and hundreds of years, the Romans are probably not going to build anything there. It's a floodplain. It's, yeah. it's ridiculous. But because it's a big open space, that's what you can develop. So it already starts in the fifth century. The, the, the uh, Villa Publica and the Saipta for the voting, that's already 435 BC. And then it kind of doesn't have much more beyond that. 
but there are playing fields, there are chariot racing places, there are places for the military to, to practice the maneuvers. Right. So they use it when it's dry. And then the real step up really is uh, Pompey the Great. Where he says, look, this is a huge opportunity. So I'm gonna put something here and it's gonna be a definitive new permanent structure in the Campus Marshes area. And it rose up around 45 to 50 meters in height is what we think. Okay. That would've been a monster statement. So that was his, uh, his uh, six, uh, what is it, the, the theater, right? The theater complex, it really would've been an enormous statement. Okay. And he would have dominated the entire landscape of the campus marshes. And it's like in the Coliseum time, or something. At that time, how did they, so did they at first not avoid the flooding or at some point they... they so they always are going to have, with the passing of time, they have more and more regulations of the, of the uh, Tiber, uh, dredging uh, of the Tiber, flood walls for the Tiber, and so on. But most of it, I mean, is clearing the path so to make sure it's not uh, too jammed up with you know, timbers and then boats and so forth. Uh, the right. real reality is that they were very confident at that point with concrete. So they could uh, pour down the pilings in wood, pour in the concrete, and they thought, you know what, this is going to be stable enough to sustain that massive weight of the rest of the structure. They just, right. I think that they, that they knew they were going to have to deal with flooding. They knew that. But they thought this is something that's going to be able to weather those storms. Okay. And, and it was. That's nice. So yeah, so bridges were a great, a really great thing because they connected places. They uh, they really uh, great structures that can be, if in the way of the Roman construction, can be replicated in many places, and they can connect these different sites. Especially at that time that uh, Rome was a very small city at, at first. Yes, and they started to to uh, grow and including, they started to include uh, different communities and different settlements that were around uh, the city, right? Right, and I mean, ultimately, I mean, when we look at the, the city with the final number of bridges, it's, it's pretty phenomenal. And that really uh, speaks to the, the, just the fact in the Imperial period, how much traffic there is here, how much movement was required. And so they just necessitated more and more and more bridges. It's kind of, it's amazing. So you go to downtown Rome today and there's a whole series of modern bridges. You can right. basically replace each one of them with an ancient bridge. There are that many bridges, but there were that many people. There are so many ways that you can learn about the aspects of ancient Rome and its legacy. If you do uh, not, yeah, look at this guy. If you do not follow Manuel Bravo and his YouTube channel, Manuel Bravo, you are missing out. So get involved, subscribe. Of course, you can follow Ancient Rome Live. Definitely follow Manuel and you'll learn so much, so many aspects of Ancient Rome and its legacy. And especially its architecture. Especially its architecture. Yeah. And not just in Rome, you can go around so much of Egypt, Europe. Egypt, Turkey, uh, all, all sorts of uh, places that you probably like. So have a look.